Um, how many of you have ever experienced something that you didn't want to experience, but looking back, you're glad you did? Anybody? Just keeping it 100, as the kids would say. This usually plays itself out in my life with food. Let me just, let me just say, I love Mexican food. I think Mexican food is going to be on the buffet in heaven. I think it's going to be a Mexican buffet, which are hard to find in this sinful world. But in, when we get to glory, y'all, there will be cheese dip unlimited. There will be burritos flowing. So anybody, anybody that knows me knows I love to go to Mexican. If you ask me, where do you want to go eat? It, don't ask me if you don't want me to answer Mexican. And I don't care what kind of Mexican. I'll, I'll, I'll do Moe's. I'll do, I'll, I consider all that in the Mexican family, okay? Well, a few months ago, Melissa and I were on a, a date night, and we were trying to decide where we wanted to go eat. And if you've ever had that discussion with your spouse, you know, a date night can quickly become, get you closer to divorce, trying to figure out where you want to go eat. And so we're trying to figure it out. Well, of course, I wanted to go to Mexican, which she has agreed to in the past. She doesn't care. She doesn't mind. She just wants to be with me. But this particular Friday evening, I thought, I'm not going to suggest Mexican. We're going to do something else. Well, she loves Italian food. And so we end up at this Italian restaurant. We pull in the parking lot and we get inside and I'm, I'm whining. I'm, I'm whining internally. I don't think I ever whined externally. Good. She said no. <laughs> and so we go in and there's a wait to get a table. I'm thinking, Mexican restaurants, you don't usually have to wait. <laughs> we finally get seated. They bring us the menu. I look at the menu and I'm thinking, I could get fajito, fajitas for two for cheaper than this. You know what I'm saying? And then we ordered, and then we waited. You don't have to wait that long at a Mexican restaurant. There's like six ingredients. They mix them different. They warm your plate up and say, here, here's a hot plate. <laughs> the food finally came. I took one bite, and y'all, it changed my life. It was awesome. And it was then that I realized sometimes God will bless you in ways that you never even wanted. Have you ever had one of those experiences where maybe you were wanting to move to one town, it didn't work out. But looking back, you're so glad it didn't. Maybe there was like a certain relationship that you really wanted and you didn't. It didn't go the way you wanted it to. But looking back, you're actually glad it didn't go the way you wanted it to. If you're an adult for more than like 10 minutes on planet Earth, you will go through things that you didn't want to go through, won't you? Bad things do happen. People do betray us. Financial struggle does strike. Struggles happen. We do have disagreements with other people. Other people abandon us. Other people betray us. And the truth is, is that your pain breaks God's heart. And I think some of us are kind of bought in to the idea that God loves to watch us go through pain. Like when we're hurting, God's standing up there on his little golden throne and he's got his arms crossed. He's like, serves them right because they're not perfect. Some of us have that, have that mental image, don't we? God has never once sat in heaven, seen your pain, seen your struggle and thought, you know what? I am so glad they're having to go through trouble. As a matter of fact, I would even, I would even go to the, to the point of saying that one of Satan's lies in our world today is that the world is a mess and it's God's fault and he's happy about it. Because if, if Satan can convince you that God enjoys your pain, why would you want to be close to that God? And so what he'll do is he'll lie and he'll tell us, no, God is happy with your pain. Your pain does not make God happy. A few months ago, I was praying through a, a life situation of, of my own and I was sitting in my chair early in the morning like I, I always do and God spoke to me. And now I know sometimes Y'all hear preachers say God spoke to me. It's really not that epic, as epic as you think it is. It's more of just a, a feeling or a thought that I just know isn't from me. Do y'all ever get those? We've talked about that, how to hear from God, that kind of thing. And so I felt like God spoke to me. Jonathan, do you enjoy seeing your child go through pain? You are a lousy father compared to me. Why would you think for just a moment that I enjoy your pain and I want it to last? Why would you think that God does not enjoy your pain? 
But God does have the ability to do something in, in, a, in, in the midst of your pain. The beautiful thing about our God, y'all, is that he can see the big picture, that he sees the entirety of eternity's timeline all at once. He has always been, he will always be. And so he has the ability to see your entire life, the entire eternity, and he has the ability to be in control of that and to do the things that he wants to do. He is the master planner, executor. God is the greatest chess player in history. And he has the ability to take care of it all. And so certainly he can work through our pain and our trial. And certainly it won't always make sense because we don't have that ability. At least I don't. Today, I want to talk for the next couple of hours from this topic. I'm just kidding. If you're a guest, you're like, um, uh." Just the next few minutes from this topic, the unwanted blessing. The unwanted blessing. I want to try to answer this question as we finish up this What's This For series. I want to try to answer the question of why do we go through trial and why do we go through trouble and why do we go through pain with what seems like a simple answer. And, and that is if, if we're followers of Jesus, sometimes you and I will go through trials to make us more like Jesus simply to sculpt us into who he is. And so in order to understand how God uses our trials to make us more like Jesus, we need to understand what God's goal for our life is, what God's purpose is for our life. Believe it or not, God's purpose for your life isn't to make your life miserable. That's the thought we have sometimes, right? Like if I start following God, he's gonna send me out in the middle of the desert in some foreign country and I'm not gonna be able to eat anything but bugs and it's gonna be 118 degrees. That is following God. God's goal for you isn't to make your life miserable. It's not to to make you poor and unhappy and you just grin and bear it because by God, you're saved by his grace. That's not God's purpose. On the other hand, God's purpose for your life isn't to make your life easy. He's not some heavenly pinata that if you can slap with your prayer stick just right, candy will rain down. That's not God's purpose either. God's purpose for you and for me is for us to be molded into the image of Jesus through a dependent relationship on God. Why? Because as C.S. Lewis puts it, he says like this, God can't give us peace and happiness apart from himself because there's no such thing. In other words, if he is going to accomplish his purpose in your life, he has to get us to the point of fully relying and depending on him. With that in mind, I wanna get to our passage of scripture today. It's, it's in James 1. And just to kind of give you some background on the book of James, it's written by James. You know, y'all know how you can remember that? James. Okay, it's written, by, it's written by James. James is actually the half-brother of Jesus. And he understood what trial and ups and downs were like. I mean, can you just imagine being the half-brother of Jesus? Some of y'all got compared to your brothers and sisters growing up. You never had someone compare you to your brother by saying, why don't you walk on water? Why are you just swimming? Or when you showed up to the family Christmas, they didn't say, I'm sorry, we're out of turkey. Why don't you just multiply it? (laughs) James was the the half brother of Jesus. And James was actually there for, for the crucifixion of Jesus. He was there for the crucifixion. He was also there for the resurrection. In fact, James didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. If you were to go to ask and ask James, James, what makes you believe? Can you imagine how hard it is to believe that your brother is the Messiah? Some of you are like, mine acted like he thought he was. <laughs> but if you ask James, James, what made you believe that Jesus was the Messiah? He, like so many other biblical New Testament characters would say, I couldn't deny the fact that I saw a dead man come back to life. And so even Jesus' own half-brother, when he sees the resurrection, he believes that Jesus is the Messiah. And so when James writes the book of James, he's writing to a group of Jewish believers who were enduring persecution by the Roman government. 
it's, it's so bad that they've lost land. They've lost the ability to purchase things. There's a real danger in the fact that they believe in Jesus. And so James is writing to these people who are facing outward persecution from the Roman government, but it's also starting to tear up the believers. Because as often happens, outside pressure, you bring that in, right? When you're having a struggles at work, you often bring that home. And so they're kind of doing this and many are beginning to kind of turn away from the faith, turn away from what they believe in. And they're getting jealous and they're getting mad and they're getting hurt. And so those are the people that James is writing to when he says in James 1, 2, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. James is telling us that trials are an opportunity. Do you ever read stuff in the Bible like that and go, huh? Like that sounds biblical, but that ain't my real life. Like it's, it's just, it's not my first instinct when the washer and the dryer go out in the same week to say, thank you, Jesus, I have an opportunity for joy. <laughs> we don't do that. Do you, ever, do you ever read things like that and you're like, what? But there, there must be a purpose here. What, what James is, is telling us is, is he's telling us they're an opportunity for something more than just looking at the trial. Now notice what he does not say here. James doesn't say that we desire trials. He doesn't say go looking for trouble. He doesn't say pray, ask God to give you more trouble. No, he doesn't say any of that, but he, what he's telling us is he's telling us to accept trials and to see them as an opportunity, an opportunity to reframe what that trial looks like through the eyes of faith. That term consider there is a financial term actually that means evaluate. Now, if, if we're evaluating something from a financial perspective, what are we doing? We're looking at it from every possible angle. We're looking at what's wrong with it. We're looking at what it's worth. We're looking at what I'm, am I gonna be able to do with it? How long am I gonna be able to use it? What's it gonna be worth when I decide to sell it? We're looking at it from every angle. When we evaluate trials, when trials come, when the phone call we didn't want comes, when the sickness returns, when the cancer returns, when the relationship turns sour, when the stress is present, when we're anxiety ridden, when, if we evaluate those and we consider those differently, we see them not just how they make us feel in the moment, but what God could possibly do, be doing with them for the future. So my question is, what do you do? How do you evaluate the trials that you face? In the middle of the trial, how do you consider it? Do you become hopeless? You know, some people say that Fear is the opposite of faith. I don't, I don't think that's correct. I think hopelessness could be the, the opposite of faith. And it's so easy, isn't it? When it seems like it's one thing after the other, when you don't see an end result, when you don't see how you're gonna get out of it, when you don't see how God is moving those chess pieces, when you don't feel his presence, when you don't feel like you're making any headway, it can be really easy to become hopeless, can it? What do you do when the trial comes? Do you become hopeless? Do you go into fix it mode? Some of y'all are fixers. I've talked to you. Do you go into fix-it mode where you try to control it and you try to get your hands around it and you immediately try to make everything work out just the way you want to? What do you do when trials come? Do you, do you start blaming? Do you start blaming the people? It's funny because we blame the people that are closest to us, don't we? Do you start blaming yourself? Do you go into panic mode where you just get frantic and, and you don't know where to start? Many of us, even if we're followers of Jesus, can easily slip into one of those responses. James is telling us that trials don't have to feel hopeless. We don't get to choose our trial, but we do get to choose how we consider it. I, I'm fully aware that some of you right now are going through things that you would have never chosen. You wouldn't have chosen to have the relationship go this way. You wouldn't have chosen divorce. You wouldn't have chosen to have the financial situation that you have right now. You wouldn't have chosen it. 
You wouldn't have chosen to have the relationship break down. You wouldn't have chosen to lose your job. You wouldn't have chosen it. What I'm telling you is you don't always have control over the situation and the trial that you face, but you always have control over how you respond and how you'll look at your situation. You always have control how you're gonna consider the trial, how you're gonna look at the trial in front of you. Here's a statement I want you to write down or type on your phone. You can totally get your phone out right now, it's, it's fine. I want you to type this out. As a follower of Jesus, I choose to see trials are blessed opportunities, not hopeless burdens. As a believer, I choose to see that trials are blessed opportunities, not hopeless burdens. Burdens. Can you imagine if you go into your next trial, if you see that man at work tomorrow, who you know every time you see him, there's going to be a trial. Can you imagine if you go into that situation saying, I choose to see it as a blessed opportunity, not a hopeless burden. Can you imagine the power in that? It's the beauty and the benefit of living with a relationship with Jesus, he doesn't prevent the trials. As a matter of fact, Jesus even, John 16, says, in this world, you will have trouble, you will have trials. Jesus doesn't prevent the trials, but he does give us an opportunity to see things differently and consider them differ- differently. And so James says, consider it all joy. It's a definitive decision, not a default one. We don't default to considering our trials with joy, but it's a definitive decision saying, I have a relationship with Jesus. I know the faithfulness of my God. And so I will choose to see this. I will frame this. I will consider every nook and cranny of this situation and see it as an opportunity for God to do something through it. So how do we do it? When we face trials, we have to evaluate them in the light of who God is and what he's doing in our life. We have to remember the character of God even in the, midst when it's, even in the midst of the situation where it seems like his character may have changed. It has not. We have to remember who God is. We have to remember that, no, I, I know that the mountain's in front of me, but I know my God loves me. I know he's powerful. I know he can do something. I know he can work. I know that this isn't too big for him. We have to see our trials through the eyes of our God and through the character of God. In fact, I believe that who we really believe God is, is made known to us during trials. Here's here's the key in all of this I've come to find out. Our values determine our evaluation. Our values determine our evaluation of a situation. What's most important to me will come through when the trial happens, if I value comfort the least little bit of thing that makes me uncomfortable is gonna shake my faith. If I value control, unpredictable situations is gonna have me grasping for air. If I value material things, the least bit of financial trouble is going to shipwreck my faith. If I value ease of life, even small inconveniences will have me backing up from God. If we value surface happiness, even small conflicts will bring t- turmoil. But if we value God and his plan and what he is doing, we will evaluate things differently. Our values will determine our evaluation. So how will you choose to see your burdens? Will you see them as a blessed opportunity or a hopeless burden? James says, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In other words, trials are inevitable. Trials are going to happen. James doesn't write to these Jewish believers and say, you don't have any real trouble. You don't, it's not that bad, suck it up. It's not that bad, just deny it. Just believe, don't, don't acknowledge it. He doesn't, he doesn't, he's not writing some positive thinking theology in James chapter one. And you've, you've had people do that, haven't you? where they dismiss your pain and your trial and tell you to suck it up, that it's really not that big of a deal, that if you don't acknowledge it, it'll go away. James isn't doing that here. He is saying trials are inevitable. They will happen. And so it would be wrong of James to write these, to these Jewish believers who are undergoing unspeakable persecution and try to tell them it's not that big of a deal. 
that trials don't happen that pain doesn't happen. It would be ridiculous of me to stand up here this morning and tell you that you don't really go through any junk. Y'all would throw stuff at me. You would kick me out and tell me to wake up and get a life. I am not here to deny that trouble comes and that life isn't hard and that people don't abandon you and that people don't stab you in the back and things don't happen that are tough. And other people don't cause us pain. And even sometimes we make our own decisions that cause us pain. What I will say, though, is that they're an opportunity for God to do something. When I was writing this message a couple of months ago, I, I was reading the scripture. And in, in my head, it makes much more sense to say that trials are inevitable. So trials are an opportunity. It makes much more sense in my mind to say trials will come, consider them joy. That just seems more pretty, right? It just seems like it should be the timeline. Okay, trials will come, consider them joy. And so as I, as I was thinking through this, I almost did some playful sermon writing to switch these around. By the way, when I'm writing messages, the hardest part for me is organizing all the content I have. Like y'all should, y'all should see how things flip, flip around from bottom to top, from top to middle, even the day before. But anyway, that's, the, that's my ADD talking. But what I wanted to say was, I, I wanted to say trials are inevitable, consider them an opportunity. But it was almost like in that moment, God stopped me and said, no, I inspired James to write it this way. And do you know why I think he did? I think James writes it this way because being determined to see your trial as an opportunity for joy is a decision that happens before the trial ever gets there. Because outlook often determines outcome. And so it's a decision that you make before you get into the trial of saying, I know who my God is and I know he will be faithful. I know who my God is and I know he's up to something bigger than I can see. It's a, it's a predetermination. It's a, it's a predecision with faith. And so as we walk with God, we have to walk in the faith and be predetermined that we're gonna trust God. That we're gonna trust him with the good we're going to trust him with the bad. We're going to trust him to make the bad good. And by the way, these, these trials that we're talking about this morning, this isn't just the big stuff. This isn't just the going through the divorce. This isn't just the filing bankruptcy. No, th this is the little stuff too. This is the me waking up on a Tuesday morning and feeling a little anxious for no reason. God cares about every single one of those trials and it is an opportunity for you to consider, to reframe, to evaluate things differently. So James spends a verse telling us that and then he gives us some why behind it. Verse three says, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It's the unwanted blessing. It's the Italian dinner. It's perseverance. The unwanted blessing is perseverance. James says, all of this is for you to develop perseverance. I know you don't like it. I know you don't want it, but God is doing something. He's developing in something inside of you. He's developing perseverance and perseverance has a purpose. Perseverance is the ability to keep going even when things get hard. It's, it's stay in power. We don't like perseverance in today's culture, do we? I mean, I could have almost just dropped a four letter word and you would have been more comfortable with it than me saying perseverance. Because we like to quit things. We live in a quick cancel culture. We live in a culture that says, if you don't, if they're not doing what you want them to do, just call the whole thing off. The relationship isn't going well, just get out of it. If you don't like the job, just quit. If you, don't, if you don't want to do it anymore, just bow out. Just quit. If you've been doing the diet for two days and you're not shredded yet, just quit. We don't, we don't like perseverance, but, but here, here, here's the deal. Is what really becomes a blessing is when you stick it out and let it develop something inside of you. In the Bible, perseverance isn't some passive acceptance of all of the bad stuff that happens to us. No, it's a courageous perseverance in the face of suffering and difficulty. The word 
testing that James uses here is the same word used by Peter in 1 Peter 1, 7, when he says, these trials will show you, show you that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is much more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. True relationship and true faith must pass the test. Whether you realize it or not, this plays itself out in your everyday life. John, will you bring me that chair? Not because my feet are getting tired. Let's, let's show it like this. I walk by this chair multiple times a week over there. I know this chair. It's black, plastic, sturdy, not the most comfortable thing. But I, I, I know this chair. I, I, I can walk by this chair. I can put my foot in this chair. I can kick the chair. I don't know why I would, but I could cook, kick the chair. But until, how, how will I know that I can trust this chair? Not until I sit in it. And it's the same way with your faith. God knows that you will never see him in his fullness until your faith is tested. That as long as it's pie in the sky and maybe you talk about him occasion, maybe you come to church occasion, maybe you know a few right things about him, maybe you tell a few people about him, but God knows that your faith isn't real until it's tested, until you sit down. And so sometimes some things will come into your life and to my life where we have to finally test our faith and say, God, is this real? real. And when we get to the other side, what we can declare is that God got me through it. My faith was tested and it passed. I tested God. I believed him and he passed. His character is good. And so when we get to the next trial, when we get to the next thing, we know we have a landing spot in our faith with God. God will do things to develop your faith, to test your faith so that you can see his faithfulness and you can see, no, this isn't just some, some let's make everybody feel better speech. This isn't just some manipulative moral concept. No, this is a God who is worth me trusting and he's built it inside of me and I see him in a new way. That's why God does it to develop perseverance so that your faith can be tested and you can know, you can know that you know that you know that he is worth, he is worth your faith. In verse four, James says, it's so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Which when you read that surface level, it's like, I've never had perseverance and faith pay a bill. You know what I'm saying? How many of you would feel like, would, would be honest and say, I feel like I'm lacking something today? Maybe it's peace. Maybe it's patience. Maybe it's faith. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's wisdom. These Jewish believers that James is writing to would have definitely felt like they were lacking something. But here's what I've noticed about my walk with the Lord in my short few years, is that my trials actually reveal to me what blessing truly is. That my trials actually reveal to me what blessing truly is. You, you see, you and I will never know that God is all we need until God is all we have. You will, you will never know that you cannot just sit in the chair, but you can relax in the chair of your faith, but you'll never get it until you see that he's really all you need. And I know that still doesn't pay your bills, still doesn't make everything okay, but it provides so much peace as you try to figure it out. And that's why some of you are tired today because you've been sitting on an unstable chair. You've been sitting in unstable faith. And 
you haven't allowed God to develop the kind of faith in you that allows you to sit back even when all hell is breaking loose around you. As believers, we choose to believe that trials are blessed opportunities, not hopeless burdens. So how do we receive God's blessing of perseverance and depend on him? We keep going. The only way to stop this is for you to bow out, for you to quit, for you to say the whole thing was a joke, for you to say it just didn't work for me. The only way for this kind of perseverance, this kind of tested faith to not come into your life is by you backing up and you saying, I didn't feel it for a moment, so I'm done. Bring your hands of it and say it was all just a big joke in the first place. You've got to stay with it. And I feel like so many of us today, so many of you are on the edge of a breakthrough of your faith. You're right there on the edge of seeing God do something incredible in that trial, in that situation. And you're thinking about giving up. You're thinking about backing away. You're thinking about kicking the chair over and not sitting down in it and allowing your faith to be tested. Can I just encourage you today? You're on the edge of a breakthrough. Stay close to God. Keep believing. Keep trusting. He is worth it. Frame it differently. Maybe God's not out to get you. Maybe he's just developing something in you. Don't give up. Let one day become two days. Let a month become a year. Let years become a life of having your faith proven over and over and over again. And you will get there. God is doing something that you can't imagine or see. This message today literally applies to everyone that's hearing it. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, if you are a follower of Jesus, let me ask you, have you bowed out? Have you allowed hard days to become unbelieving years? Have you quit? And I'm not just talking about like you quit and you started worshiping some other God or something like that. I'm not talking about, have you quiet quit? Have you quiet quit on God? Have you continued to go through the motions, but you don't really believe it? Have you continued to talk the talk for your family? But you don't ever seek seek God. Or maybe some of you, you've blamed God because you thought the trials were a curse felt like he was mad at you and you didn't see the big picture. If if you're not a believer in Jesus, have you viewed this whole thing wrong? Like, have you viewed what goes on in our world to be evidence that God has backed away? And maybe over the last few minutes, you've seen, no, God still has a plan. He's still the ultimate chess piece mover. And I just didn't understand that his plan is bigger than than mine. And so what's it going to take for you to possess the unwanted blessing? What is it gonna take for you to develop perseverance and for your faith to be tested and proven true? For some of you this morning, you need to recommit your life to Jesus. You have a relationship with him, but you haven't been following him. And the reason why is because you got mad and you left. He didn't leave you. And so this morning you need to pray and you need to recommit your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, I've had it all wrong. I need something stable. I need this unwanted blessing. I know you're developing perseverance. Jesus, I come back to you. I'm reframing what I've been through. I trust you. For some, you need to change your view of the trial that you're in right now. Because you've been evaluating and you've been framing it one way. You need to keep evaluating because You need to see all angles of that thing. And you need to see that maybe, just maybe, God is doing something and that everything that comes to you passes through his hand and he's up to something bigger. For some, you need to look back and you need to have inspiration in your trial now because it's been proven that your faith, that God can withstand the test 
that you're going through. Your past, he was there. He was faithful and somehow you stuck with him. And he certainly stuck with you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm gonna give you a chance to respond to God's word for you this morning. I don't, I don't know what you need to do, but I know you don't need to give up. In this moment, just for a few seconds, I know it may even feel a little awkward with me not talking, but can we just have a personal conversation with God right here in this moment? And ask God, just say, God, what are you doing? God, what are you doing in my situation? God, help for me to be able to consider them joy because you're doing something that's too big for me to understand. What, what do you need to ask God right now? relationship with Jesus and I don't blame you for feeling hopeless because if I had to face the trials that I face in my life every day without the hope of heaven and without the hope of God interacting on my behalf I would feel hopeless too this morning you need a relationship with Jesus and let me tell you what that means it's just a surrender it's you falling into the chair of God's arms and saying, God, I can't do this anymore. I can't be good enough. I need you. It's not walking in perfection. It's not always having perfect faith. It's having willing faith. It's being willing to persevere through the ups and the downs. So if you need a relationship with Jesus this morning, you can pray this prayer. It's, it's really not even about the prayer. The Bible says if you admit that you're a sinner, that you've missed the mark, if you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and if you confess it, confess him as Lord that you'll be saved and so that's all of this prayer is just say Jesus I surrender to your ways and to a life with you I admit that I've messed things up that I have sinned but I believe you are who you say you are just like James I believe that you're the son of God and that you're the resurrected Messiah I give my life to you. Help for me to follow you. God, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice this morning. God, I, I thank you for this amazing church. God, as I look over this crowd of people, God, so many trials that they're facing go through my mind. God, I thank you that you're, that you're building something. And I pray that their faith would be tested and they would develop perseverance so that they can see you for who you really are so they can see how blessed they are with just simply you and thank you that your word is just as applicable now as it was 2,000 years ago when James wrote them thank you that it shows us who we are, but more importantly, who you are. God, I thank you for the opportunity to, to teach your word. Now, Holy Spirit, I ask you to take over and continue to, to grow it inside of the spirits of these people that have just heard it. Holy Spirit, do what I can't do. Make sense of my words. Thank you that you love us more than we can imagine. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.